just made this comment and it really sparked the sermon for today. It is a great day to worship God. That was a weekday. It wasn't Sabbath, Sunday, or any day. It was just a great day to worship God. And I told her, I headed back to the office and came back and I said, you know what? That statement really needs to be filled out and appreciated by all of us. And especially in our lives to recognize that we are called to live in worship. And when we think about worship, worship is praise to God for who He is, what He has done, what He is doing, and what He will do. It is a delight to be able to know the sense of security, the love, the hope, the joy, and the faith that we can have in our Heavenly Father. Then it made even more sense as I got thinking about, historically at this time of year, what would I be doing? If I went back 30 years and Carol was smiling, I'd be telling you about how you need to get rid of sin how you need to repent, and how you need to make sure you've got all the leavening out of your house. And I'd be reminding you of all the possibilities of sin. And you would be thinking, man, I've got a lot of work to do between now and next week or whatever. But I wouldn't have just done that for one week. Historically, it was like, we didn't call it Lent, but it was a Lenten kind of season because we were trying to make sure we got everything right as we move for the Passover. The reality, brethren, when we live in worship with God, and next week we're going to do the communion service, the invitation is an incredibly wonderful, heartwarming invitation to come and commune with God, not be rebuked of God, not be rejected of God, not live in fear, not any of those things whatsoever. It is a day and a time to worship. So living in worship changes every day of our lives, now and forever. And it reminded me of the scripture there in the book of Psalms, that this is the day the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice, except for those six weeks prior to Passover. I, I'm, and, and I'm not trying to be mean, or, but I'm just trying to help us to realize that when we, when we sh- have shifted from a Passover, an Israelitish view of putting blood on the doorpost, uh, making sure that you've gotten rid of all your sins uh, and, and your neighbor, all, all the things that are necessary to do, as opposed to living in the new covenant with what Jesus has given us to do, what Jesus has done in our life. And then I thought, well, that's quite a call, but the reality in our life is that we all realize that we're inadequate, and we, as Karen and I, we like to call, we call each other, we're just hoots, you know, because one time we're full of faith and smiles and all, and the next time we go, oh, we were in the mully grubs, we just, our humanity has such an impact on our life. So I want to give us an example today from John chapter 4 where Jesus is talking about worship and he's inviting of all people this lady we, we, know, we know her as the woman at the well the Samaritan woman and I think it's, it's encouraging because of a number of factors that we're going to look at who is doing the inviting it is Jesus is there anything about this lady that he doesn't know no, he knows everything about his lady, this lady, and what, what he is going to tell her, and the encouragement. And then central to this is what we're going to touch on today, is John chapter 4, verses 23 and verse 24, 
where Jesus reminds us of this responsibility here about worship. Yet the time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. It is in this context that it takes on a whole new interesting dynamic where we find a joy, a peace like never before as we look forward to having communion with Jesus, remembering Jesus and all that he has done for us. So what we find here, there are a number of points that we find in these two verses, in 20, verses 23 and verse 24, and here are just some of them. The hour has come and now is. So we're talking about presently. Not future, but in this very moment. The hour has come. Not just a day, but that moment. Then he has another statement about true worshipers worshiping the Father. And we think about, okay, a, a, a true worshiper. And what will a, a true worshiper do? He will worship the Father. And this is encouraging. And they will worship how? In spirit and in truth. It isn't about the physical, it's about the spiritual. Because Jesus himself says, you know, the flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit. And we also worship in truth. And what is the truth of the matter? As well, we find that the Father seeks those individuals to worship him. It is in this relationship that the Father wants to have with each and every one of us. He seeks. So, I mean, we have so many examples given to us by Jesus. The example of the prodigal son, how the Father sought the son and was willing for the son to come back and had open arms for him. A realization as well here in these verses that God is spirit. He is, he's not like us. Yet he did send his son, he became one of us, the son became one of us. And they that worship must worship him. So there's not a lot of leeway as some people may think. You can worship whatever you choose to worship. It is about worshiping him. So when we contrast to our old ways of preparing for the Passover, for example, repentance and penance and seeking out sin being negative and fearful response to God and salvation, and the limitation to one night, one night out of the year, in which you are washed clean by the blood of Christ, by the Passover, followed by seven days in which you're trying to keep yourself clean, <laughs> trying to keep sin out of your life. And we know how difficult that is and how tricky it is. The things that we have eaten, ice cream cones. Oh, they got leaven. And we are watching uh, uh, a thing last evening that involved the Sadar. And, and, well, you can't even have flour. Well, or in certain cases, it's got to be gluten-free. There's, there's little ideas and things that you tack on to all the things for seven days. You're busy trying to do that and keep yourself out of trouble. So you just have the night of the Passover, you have the seven days of unleavened bread. But living in worship is living in communion with God through Jesus. And as we sit here today, we're not a bit afraid of breaking bread with Jesus. We're not anxious. Interesting, we're not over anxious even about our sins. Though we were very, I mean, we, we make an, an effort on all of our part not to sin, to know what sin is. You know, as I was speaking last week, and uh, the, the sermon title was Speaking the Truth in Love from the book of Ephesians, where the Apostle Paul said that, and he's addressing it to the church. One thing I want to clarify for us that I think that we need to understand, and maybe it was clear, but in my mind, looking back, and I think, well, there, I think maybe there needs to be some clarity to this, is that the idea that speaking the truth in love is that you just say soft things to people all the time. And you just gloss over everything. That's not the reality because Paul addresses the problems that the, the average church member in Ephesus had. Anger, lying, stealing, 
morality. He, he discusses all of those things. The problem that we face in our world today is that if you were to say to someone, and this is the difficult, I don't agree with you because I believe that what you're doing goes contrary to what the Bible, what God, what Jesus teaches. I don't believe that adultery is condoned. Now, I can't stop you. This is, and I can't change it, but I don't believe that. I, in fact, I believe it is a sin. In our world today, well, who are you? Who are you to judge me? I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just telling you what I believe. And I believe that if living a life like God wants brings better rewards, it brings a better life, it brings, uh, just changes everything. So speaking the truth in love is not about not speaking truth, and it's not about loving, but in our world today, you can very quickly be called a bigot, judgmental, and those are the things that people love, and it's, you find it difficult. And I think that we'll continue to find it even more difficult. So having said that, I want to come back to the fact that we have communion with God because we know that Jesus is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is the one who is directing us. We are asking God to, to allow Christ to live his life in us each and every day. So again, getting back to the living in worship is living in communion with God through Jesus Christ. Enjoying this day. Looking forward to enjoying tomorrow. Enjoying the calling that we have, the hope that we have. And saying, ah, next week when I break bread and I take that, this is my dear friend who loves me, who gave his life for me, and wants me as a good shepherd to have life and have life abundantly. Because we have to recognize that worship is relational to God in his love, in his calling, and in his purpose for us. We also have to realize not all humanity accepts that or wills or wants to worship God. Not everybody wants to do that, and that's a choice that they can and they do make. But God doesn't limit worship and joy to just to worship to a day. We're talking about living in worship is a, a lifetime thing every day of our life. When I woke up this morning at 3.30 in the morning, and I'm lying there and I'm thinking, hmm, this, and I'm thinking about people and, and things, and, and but my, fortunately, my bed is really, really, really comfortable. So it's not a problem at all because I'm thinking. And then by, here, here was the joy of it. By 5 o'clock, I figured out, I say, say I had figured out, I had this idea of what I'm going to do for summer camp on team building. And it's like, yes, this is an Lord, thank you. This is a good idea. Now, and I'm get, I, I do want to give him credit for it because I, I believe that he gave me the idea and I'm hoping that it's going to be a wonderful idea that will be very helpful. So, you see, it can be 5 o'clock in the morning or 3.30 in the morning or it can, it can be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It can be any time, but it's like, Every moment is a time to live in worship because of who God is all the time. Not who we are all the time, but who He is all the time. So we find that it's not limited. And it, worship involves knowing who God is. That changes the timing fact. Oh, it's like God is just God on Saturday, or God is just God on Sunday. Or God is just God on the millennium? No, God is God all the time. Jesus was God in the flesh on the cross. And Jesus is our Lord and Savior now. So we're encouraged by the whole setting that is embraced by Christ. So let's take a look at the downside, because we all see our downside. So let's take a look at the person that Jesus is talking to and what he is offering to her. 
First, in John chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, this woman is a Samaritan. Now, it's a region of, I don't know, all of us probably have some prejudices about regions of the country. West Coast people do not generally like East Coast people. Northerners do not like Southerners. I came from myself, I lived a long time in L.A. L.A. is Lower Alabama. I see, yeah, yeah, it brings out a bit of laughter, doesn't it, because L.A. and Alabama. No, I, I spent a lot of years in Alabama and Georgia in the southeast with people, and I'm going to use the term, but I don't like the term because I know a good number of people. they call called rednecks. But I, I've talked to those, those very hospitable, warm, friendly people. Hardworking people. We, we all have our foibles, if you want to call it that, or descriptions, but we all have prejudices along the line. So, but this woman was from Samaria, and when it comes to religion... The, the Jews despise them. So, we, so she's from the city of Sychar in Samaria. She's also a woman. What's the big deal there? Well, it was a big deal back then. Because a woman, Jesus a Jew, from Jerusalem, you don't have talk with them. You don't give them the time of day. So this lady comes, she comes to the well, and Jesus is there, and Jesus initiates the exchange. He's the one who starts the conversation. Otherwise, there would not have been a word said. She just simply stayed her distance, did what she needed to do in drawing water, and gone back home. But Jesus initiates the exchange. This is true of us in our life as well. Jesus initiates the exchange. And so he's asking her to draw water from this well. And when we read this, um, she, she, her first response when he says here, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, Now we're, we're going to start talking about identities. You are a Jew. And I am a Samaritan. It's stating the obvious. I'm a, but I'm not, not only am I a Samaritan, I am a Samaritan woman. How, how can you ask me for a drink? Because if I give you a drink, anything I touch is tainted. How can I give you a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, If you knew the gift, and it wasn't just if you knew what God could do, if you knew the gift, and a gift is something that is given freely, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living waters. So what a different approach. Jesus introducing, as it were, himself by initiating conversation, and then he goes well beyond that. He says, if you've known the gift, think about that in terms of the past, Passover, and think about that in terms of communion. If you knew what I want to give you in communion, what is it that Jesus wants to give us in communion? And the answer is quite simple. Communion. He wants us to connect with him. He wants us to understand the relationship. He wants us to remember Him and who He is, what He has done, and how, how He has loved us. And it isn't that I just want some water. I want to give you living water. What is the bread that we take is the bread of life. This is what He wants us to have, a life, to live life. A life that brings us into worship, where we... I, one of the songs that I, I dearly love is, All Creation Worships You. So, if all creation worships God, and even one of the songs we talked about, the rocks, the hills, the trees, all of those things today, 
All creation worships God. Is that one day a week for 24 hours? Or is it every moment? I mean, walk out in the evening and look up at the sky and see the stars and the heavens and you think, wow, it's awesome. Walk out in the morning and you see the dew in the grass, the sun rising. Or, for me, you walk out in the evening and those frogs are just, I mean, they're quite a choir. I got a choir of frogs that just sing springtime. They're, they're the spring singer, singers in the line. So when we look at how that the creation responds to God all the time and how awesome and how wonderful it is. So the woman responds here, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. So I got you there. What do you mean you're going to give me living waters? This ain't going to happen because you don't have a way to do that. You don't have a bucket. You don't have a cup. And the well is too deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you great? Now she's going to start to make comparisons. This is what we, we compare. And this is what Israel did. Well, let's, let's compare the manna to the bread of life. Let's compare these things to, to this. And there is no comparison. We think about it. It's just a shadow of things to come. So, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? Oh, you think about it. You can give us gift. Jacob gave us this great well. And drank from it himself. As did also the sons and his flocks and his herds. Are you greater than all of that? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So it's a living water that he is giving them. And he, so he's dealing with this woman who's questioning him, has negative thoughts, has feelings of inferiority, is promoting even more the, the way it used to be. And Jesus is talking about a river of water. And Jesus uses that same example later on. In, uh, John is quoted in John chapter 7. He says, you know, the Holy Spirit, which are bellies of living water that flow out of you. And that's a continual. So, again, the one that wants to return to a physical form of worship. And, you know, our father Jacob, this esteemed well. And Jesus again tells her, the living water has continually, it'll take us all the way to, into, through, and continue on in eternal life. This is what God has called us. So, there's a bit of reproving challenge. So, it's a bit cynical. Well, you, okay then, if that's the case, verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Yeah, prove it. Give me this water. And he told her, Go call your husband and come back. Now, I, this is, I think, important for us to understand, brethren, because Jesus is introducing a little something different about what he knows about her and her situation. And yet he's still having this conversation about giving her living water. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So he knows her checkered past. He, you know, she's a lady who's had five husbands. The woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. She hasn't got up to Jesus being the Son of God or anything like that. I can see you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but you Jews, again, we're, we're calling Jesus, you Jews, separating, claim that the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, 
is what he tells her. A time is coming when you will worship your father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Here Jesus, Jesus is referring to, again, the relationship that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have together. He is talking about where to worship, when to worship, how to worship. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. This, at the end, just opens up our ability to, do, to wake up every morning and say, this is a good day to worship God. Because every day and every hour is a good day to worship God. And is there a moment in our life when it's not a good moment to worship God? Has there ever been? Well, we all know that there have been times when we don't feel like worshiping God and we're negative in the light, but there's never been a time that isn't a good time to worship God. When you look at even the outline prayer, do the will of the Father, you know, as is in heaven. When you read the book of Revelation, it is about worship. It is about a relationship that is continual. It is the incredible journey with God that we have. So she reproves him, and he challenges her on this. So we understand in this that the woman is, again, not the purest of people. From As you look at it, and yet Jesus continues to talk to her. And then she underestimates Jesus and challenges him in the worship. And Jesus does not say this. She says, this is where men ought to worship. Jesus is not talking to a man. He's talking to a woman. And of course, women should not preach. What does this woman do? <laughs> she hears all the things that Jesus tells us. He, she goes in town and she starts preaching the gospel. She starts preaching. Jesus is preaching to a woman and she's going and spreading the message about who he is. And then Jesus challenges. So Jesus includes this woman in worship. He, he shows her in verse 21, the place is not the important thing. I mean, we live in a world today where we've got to reestablish the temple. And nothing can happen until the temple is reestablished. And yet we realize that we are the temple of God's Spirit. And also... Jesus challenges her and says, believe me. Believe me. Verse 22, about the need to know who we worship. And that salvation is of the Jews, that it is through Christ. And then coming back now to the central theme here in verses 23 through 24, this is central to worship. Is there any time when worship is not appropriate? Is there any time? Can, can we think of it? Think about Jesus hanging on the cross when he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He's doing the will of the Father. Who's he addressing? The Father. He, he is connecting with God. And then he's, he's talking to John. This, this is your mother. Take care of her. The, the things, there is never a time it's not inappropriate to worship God. So it's important that we understand that and appreciate it. Is there any time when God doesn't love us? Now, let me speak to parents. Is there any time you don't love your kids? No. Are there times when you're, you're hurt and they do things that you wish they wouldn't do. But what have you learned from God? What have we learned from God? We've learned this. There's a lot of times in our lives when we didn't follow our Father and we didn't do what He wanted us to do. We were going to have our own way. And yet, 
He was there for us, has always been there for us, and has always loved us. There is not a time when God doesn't love us. There is not a time that Jesus is not willing to lay down his life for us because he is a good shepherd. So when we think about it, our whole life is about worshiping. And then worshiping in spirit and truth changes everything. Worship is our life in Christ, in spirit. And therefore, we're able to see, because God's spirit working in us, that it isn't just about the physical, it is about the spiritual. It is about God directing our life and what, what the Spirit says. As Jesus said to his disciples, these words are spiritual and they're life. And when we think about truth, what is truth? Jesus is truth. And he sees beyond our shortcomings. The truth of the matter do you think Jesus loved this woman at the well? Oh, she's a Samaritan. She's got five husbands. She is the first person that Jesus tells, I am the Messiah. He tells it to this woman. Because we, as we read toward the end, we're reminded, I am he. This is verse 26. Spirit and truth brings us into relation with God constantly. And if we were to read, and, and we'll read this very quickly from the book of Romans, because this is the consistency and the constancy that we find about our relationship with God. Even though we have difficulties, we have problems, we know and we can appreciate that what God is doing in our lives. Beginning in Romans chapter 8, Verse 31. Here's, here's the reality of the communion and the worship they had. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword who shall separate us from worshiping God? Any of those things? No. As is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, angels, or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's never a time. And when we think about communion, that's important. Communion with Jesus is all the time. It's constantly living in his love. It is recognizing that he is our Lord he is our Savior, and as he told this woman, I am he. And so, when we get up in the morning, now is the time to worship. And that's the beauty of it. When we wake up at 3.30 in the morning, now is the time to worship. When we move through our day, a Saturday, a Sunday, a Monday, a Tuesday... Now is the time to worship. And brethren, when we sin and fall, we can get up and say, now is the time to worship. In our shortcomings, because there is a God who's called us, who loves us, in life, in everything. 
And what he has called us to is living in worship. What a delight. What a calling. He is the light of the world. He is the light of our life. And as he said in the Old Testament, I have come that you might live. And it is God's desire that we live life. Next week when we break bread, think, oh, how awesome it would be to have manna. No, brethren, how awesome it is to have Christ. Oh, how awesome it would be if the fire were swirling around and the cloud. No, how awesome it is to have the light of the world. We have so much to give God thanks for in worship. So I pray that our days, our life, our week, that we truly, every day of our life, live in communion with God, which is a life of worship. To His glory, to His praise and honor. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank You very much for Your Son. We thank You for the love for your gift that you give it to us. We thank you for the communion that we can have in Christ. And thank you that our whole life is about worshiping you in spirit and in truth to your glory. Father, you have called the weak of the world and you are doing incredible things. It has always been and it will always be about you. But what a blessing it is for us to know you and worship. And we thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name we can pray. Amen. Feeling the blues today or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life or need spiritual advice? The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. We welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen.